So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to this lecture on the appeal and history of horror movies. To begin, I'd like to examine the concept of horror and explore some of the reasons why generations of artists and audiences have been so attracted to it. Afterwards, I'll take you on a journey through the annals of horror cinema from the late 19th century to the early 21st century. I'd like to note that this presentation uh, will include images and clips from a range of different horror movies. However, none of the clips I've selected feature explicit violence, except for one moment, which I'll, I'll warn you about beforehand. The presentation will run for about 50 minutes and there'll be time for questions at the end. So let's begin. The horror genre explores one of humanity's most basic emotions and primal instincts, fear. J.A. Cudden defines the horror story as a piece of fiction which creates an eerie or frightening atmosphere. Such stories date back to ancient times and frequently depict supernatural elements such as monsters, spirits, or dark magic. However, in some stories, the source of horror may be entirely human. The most effective horror stories often deliberately conceal the source of their dread, instead generating fear through mood, sensation, and the blurring of reality and imagination. For example, Henry James's classic Gothic novel, The Turn of the Screw, offers both a supernatural and a psychological interpretation of events. In May of this year, a university survey was conducted to learn how often med horror media was consumed. Participants were asked how much horror entertainment they, used, they had used over the past year, including movies, literature and video games. Only 7% of respondents answered none, with 20% answering several times a month and 10% answering several times a week. But why do so many people consume horror fiction? Why would anyone willingly seek out something that they know is going to shock, frighten, or repulse them? The American essayist, Elizabeth Barrett, offers one exclamation. Quote, The old fight-or-flight reaction of our evolutionary heritage once played a major role in the life of every human. Our ancestors lived and died by it. Then someone invented the fascinating game of civilization and things began to calm down. Development pushed wilderness back from settled lands. War, crime, and other forms of social violence came with civilization, and humans started preying on each other. But by and large, daily life calmed down. We began to feel restless, to feel something missing. The excitement of living on the edge, the tension between hunter and hunted. So we told us each other stories through the long dark nights. And when the fires burned low, we did our best to scare the daylights out of each other. The rush of adrenaline feels good. Our hearts pound, our breath quickens, and we can imagine ourselves on the edge. Yet we also appreciate the insightful aspects of horror. Sometimes a story intends to shock and disgust, but the best horror intends to rattle our cages and shake us out of our complacency. It makes us think, forces us to confront ideas we might rather ignore, and challenges preconceptions of all kinds. Horror reminds us that the world is not always as safe as it seems, which exercises our mental muscles and reminds us to keep a little healthy caution close at hand. Thus, horror fiction is appealing to audiences because it challenges. The best horror challenges us at both an emotional level and an intellectual level. It reveals things about human psychology and provides an outlet for ideas and energies which have been repressed by the conscious mind or by the social structure. For example, one of the most common interpretations of Bram Stoker's Dracula is that it uses vampires as a metaphor for sexuality during the reserved Victorian era. The sexual aggressiveness of, fe of Stoker's female vampires frightened British audiences because they defied gender norms and broke social taboos, but also because the vampires personified the dangerous energies that the stigmatization of human sexuality might produce. This particular reading of Dracula references Professor Robin Woods's overarching theory of the horror genre, namely that horror dramatizes the, quote, return of the repressed, 
and that the monster represents a threat to normality which can never be defeated. In his landmark essay, The American Nightmare, Woods wrote that, quote, central to the effect and fascination of horror movies is their fulfillment of our nightmare wish to smash the norms that oppress us and to which our moral conditioning teaches us to revere, end quote. In order to understand the effect that horror fiction has on us, it is important to distinguish between the psychological concepts of horror and terror. On one hand, terror is a feeling of dread or anticipation that takes place before an event happens. On the other hand, horror is a feeling of shock or revulsion after an event has happened. To illustrate the difference, imagine what it feels like waiting in line for a roller coaster or even the sensation as the ride slowly ascends a steep slope. That is terror. Then compare it to the feeling of arriving at the top of the slope and hurtling down the track at breakneck speed. That is horror. Some horror stories, such as Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, are primarily exercises in tension, affecting the audience with the implication or expectation of something supernatural, but never actually delivering it. Jackson is a master of terror because she never gives the reader catharsis. She never lets the roller coaster reach the top of the slope. Some artists believe that the cultivation of terror was a noble pursuit because it gave human beings access to the sublime, which is an aesthetic quality which purportedly imparts a feeling of overwhelming or immeasurable awe. Gothic author Anne Radcliffe described terror as that which, quote, expands the soul and awakens the faculties to, to a high degree of life, whereas she described horror as that which, quote, freezes and nearly annihilates them. Along with artists and art theorists, the horror genre has also fascinated psychologists. Sigmund Freud regarded horror as an expression of the uncanny, the psychological experience of estrangement or uncertainty. Carl Jung believed horror expressed primordial archetypes which reside within the collective unconscious, such as the shadow, the archaic mother, and the anima and animus. Georges Bate saw horror as a means of transcending everyday life and going beyond rational social consciousness. Robert Solomon argued that the pleasure people derive from horror movies and books may be explained by the desire of adults to return to a state of infantile helplessness. However, contrary to Solomon's claim, a study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that some viewers, especially male viewers, enjoyed the virtual dangers which horror movies offer because it gives them the opportunity to mentally master frightening scenarios and therefore attain, attain a feeling of bravery. The same study also measured the gender socialization which can occur during the consumption of horror media. For example, young men were shown to enjoy horror movies more in the company of women who expressed fear and less in the company of women who seemed unafraid. Meanwhile, young women enjoyed horror movies more in the company of men who seemed unafraid and less in the company of men who expressed fear. Therefore, along with representing aspects of human psychology, horror movies can also play a role in the development of human psychology, especially during adolescence. There is also a possible neurochemical explanation for the popularity of horror. The sensation of fear which horror movies induce can cause our brains to be flooded with the chemical dopamine. This rush of adrenaline is meant to assist us in dangerous or life-threatening situations, as simulated by the movie, providing our bodies with pain relief and a powerful burst of energy. Rather than craving an external drug, horror fans may become addicted to their own neurochemicals. Not just the rush of danger, but the feeling of intense relief that follows when a character evades or overcomes the monster. Horror movies are as old as moving pictures themselves. The first depictions of the supernatural on screen appear in several of the silent films of pioneer French filmmaker Georges Méliès. The best known of these is the three-minute short film Le Manoir du Diable from 1896, known in English as either The Haunted Castle 
or The House of the Devil. The film is about a mischievous demon that appears inside a medieval castle where he harasses visitors. Some historians believe that the demon was played by magician Jules Eugène Legree, who later appeared in Melise's beloved 1902 film, A Trip to the Moon. Others believe Melise himself played the role. Le Manoir du Diable introduced 19th century audiences to animated skeletons, ghosts, transforming bats, and the first cinematic incarnation of the devil. The film was deemed lost for many years until a copy turned up in the New Zealand Film Archive in 1988. It is now available on YouTube. Another early example of horror, of, of horror film is the 1897 American short film, The X-Ray Fiend, which shows a couple of skeletons enjoying a romantic date. While the film has comedic elements, audiences unaccustomed to seeing moving skeletons on screen would have found it frightening and otherworldly. Japan also made an early foray into the horror genre with two films written by Ichiro Hata. They are Shinin no Sosai, which translates to Resurrection of a Corpse, and Baka Jizo, which translates to Jizo the Spook. A key innovation that these filmmakers contributed to horror films, and indeed all subsequent filmmaking, was their use of editing to produce seemingly impossible spectacles, such as disappearing, floating, and transforming objects and people. The 1900s and 1910s saw the first adaptations of classic horror novels into silent films. Edison Studios in the United States produced the first filmed version of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Several versions of the Robert Louis Stevenson's, sorry, several versions of Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde were also released during this period, as were German versions of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat and the Jewish legend of the Golem. In France, Melise made six different short films on the topic of Faust, the legend of a, man who, of a man who makes a pact with the devil. In 1911, the hour-long Italian epic L'Inferno was released. It is still considered by many scholars to be the finest film adaptation of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. The film is well remembered for its stunning and haunting visualization of the nine circles of hell. It became an international success and is arguably the first true blockbuster in all of cinema. The 1920s saw the release of two of the most important and influential horror films of all time, both of which were products of the German Expressionist art movement. The first was Nosferatu, directed by F.W. Murnau, arguably the first ever vampire-themed film. It was an unauthorized adaptation of Bram Stoker's gothic novel, Dracula. In Nosferatu, Murnau created some of cinema's most iconic horror imagery, including the famous shot of Count Orlok's shadow creeping up a staircase. Here is a clip from the film. Michael Wilmington from the Chicago Tribune called Nosferatu, quote, not just a great horror movie, but a poem of horror, a symphony of dread, a film so rapt, mysterious, and weirdly lovely, it haunts the mind long after it's over. The second significant German horror film of the 1920s was The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, directed by Robert Wein, 
It tells the story of an insane hypnotist who uses a sleepwalker to commit murders. The film was inspired by various experiences from the lives of its screenwriters, two pacifists who were left uh, distrustful of authority after their experiences with the military in World War I. Critic Roger Ebert called it arguably the first true horror film. However, it was not so much the story that distinguished this film, but its style. Film historian uh, Rick Wallen writes that, quote, Dr. Caligari's settings, some simply painted on canvas backdrops, are weirdly distorted. Uh, with caricatures of narrow streets, misshapen walls, odd rhomboid windows, and leaning door frames. Nosferatu and the cabinet of Dr. Caligari are leading examples, are leading cinematic examples of German expressionism, emphasizing a distorted reality as a representation of the characters' distorted minds. They helped draw worldwide attention to the artistic merit of German cinema and had a major influence on American films, particularly in the genres of horror and film noir. Introducing techniques such as the twist ending and the unreliable narrator to the language of narrative film. Meanwhile, in Hollywood, the 1920s also ushered in the age of the universal classic monsters, the name given to a series of horror, fantasy and science fiction films made by Universal Pictures. They began with the silent, with silent film adaptations of Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Gaston Leroux's The Phantom of the Opera. Then, in the 1930s, Universal produced sound adaptations of Dracula and Frankenstein, as well as entirely original screenplays such as The Mummy and The Wolfman. These films were a hit with audiences and would go on to make sequels and crossover movies in what would become the first ever shared cinematic universe. Universal Pictures created a monopoly on the mainstream horror film producing stars such as Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, and grossing large sums of money at the box office in the process. The 1930s also marked the first time that the term horror was used to describe the film genre. While Frankenstein was adapted for the screen several times before and afterwards, James Wales's 1931 film is arguably the most iconic version of the story and the monster. The film follows a scientist and his assistant who dig up corpses in the hopes of reanimating them with electricity. Here is a clip from the film. Notably, the use of electricity and the cobbled together appearance of the monster are inventions of Wales and not evident in Shelley's original text. According to the critical consensus on Rotten Tomatoes, Frankenstein is, quote, still unnerving to this day. It adroitly explores the fine line between genius and madness. <laughs> 
and features Boris Karloff's legendary frightening performance as the monster. With advances in technology, the tone of horror films began to shift throughout the 1950s from gothic folk tales towards contemporary concerns. A popular horror subgenre began to emerge in the form of the doomsday film. These productions featured humanity overcoming threats such as alien invasions and deadly mutations. Popular films of this subgenre include War of the Worlds from 1953, Creature from the Black Lagoon from 1954, and The Blob from 1958. Many scholars regard these films as resulting from the geopolitical tensions of the Cold War. In 1956, Invasion of the Body Snatchers was released. The film concerns an extraterrestrial invasion where aliens are capable of duplicating and replacing the human beings with whom they come into contact. It is one of the most popular and most paranoid films of the 1950s. Some critics read the film as an allegory for the loss of personal autonomy in the Soviet Union and, and in com, uh, or communist systems in general, while others read it as an allegory for the anti-communist witch hunts being conducted by US Senator Joseph McCarthy. Michael Dodd claims that the message of invasion of the body snatchers changes depending upon the viewer, arguing that, quote, uh, arguing that by, quote, simultaneously exploiting the contemporary fear of, in, of infiltration by undesirable elements, as well as a burgeoning concern over homeland totalitarianism, it may be the clearest window into the American psyche that horror cinema has ever provided, end quote. The 1950s is also well known for giant monster movies, which were also called creature features. These are usually disaster films that focus on a group of characters struggling to survive attacks by one or more antagonistic monsters, often abnormally large ones. The monster is often created by a folly of mankind, such as, ex such as an experiment gone wrong, the effects of radiation, or the destruction of habitat. Perhaps the best example of this type of film is the 1954 Japanese film Godzilla. It depicts the sudden appearance of a giant fire-breathing reptile and the efforts of scientists and politicians to deal with it. Here is a clip from the film. And so forth. Godzilla has been culturally identified as a strong metaphor for nuclear weapons and symbolizes nuclear holocaust from Japan's perspective. Producer Tomoyuki Tanaka stated that, quote, the theme of the film from the beginning was the terror of the bomb. 
Mankind had created the bomb, and now nature was going to take revenge on mankind. End quote. Director Ishiro Honda filmed Godzilla's Tokyo Rampage to mirror the atomic b- bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 1960 marks the release of Alfred Hitchcock's psychological horror film, Psycho. The film centres on an encounter between a secretary, Marion Crane, who ends up at a secluded motel after stealing money from her employer, and the hotel's owner-manager, Norman Bates. Hitchcock famously convinced theatres to post cards in their lobbies, asking patrons not to spoil the twist of the film, and to refuse entry to patrons who arrived late to screenings. Psycho received lukewarm reception from critics at the time, but was loved by the public, who waited in large lines that stretched outside the theatres and down the block. The notorious shower scene became a pop cultural touchstone and and is regarded as one of the most terrifying scenes ever filmed. Its effectiveness is often credited to the use of startling editing techniques and to the iconic screeching uh, violins in Bernard Herrmann's musical score. The film set a new level of acceptability for violence and sexuality in American films and is widely considered to be the earliest example of the slasher subgenre. Slasher subgenre. Psycho has been called the first psychoanalytic thriller, with the screenplay and visual motifs raising concepts such as the Oedipus complex, voyeurism, and dissociative identity disorder. Towards the end of the 1960s, Roman Polanski wrote and directed Rosemary's Baby, based on the best-selling supernatural horror novel by Ira Levin. The film chronicles the story of a pregnant woman who suspects that an evil cult wants to take her baby for use in their rituals. Rosemary's Baby deals with themes related to paranoia, marital abuse, women's liberation, Christianity, and the occult. The film earned almost universal acclaim from film critics and won numerous nominations and awards, further bolstering the artistic prestige of the horror genre. Another influential American horror film of the 1960s was George A. Ramiro's Night of the Living Dead. The story follows seven people who are trapped in a farmhouse in rural Pennsylvania, which is besieged by a large and growing group of reanimated human corpses. Here is a clip from the film. Please be aware that while this clip doesn't include any deaths, it does include footage of one of the undead being shot by a rifle. (laughs) 
Night of the Living Dead is considered to be the first true zombie movie, redefining the Haitian legend of undead servants into the modern cinematic incarnation of a mindless, flesh-eating plague monster. Various motifs introduced in the movie, such as the slow-moving zombie horde, their taste for human flesh and fear of fire, and their brains being their only source of weakness, have become canonical across zombie movies, TV shows, comic books, and video games. Romero has stated that his zombies were meant to be frightening in their own right, but also to serve as a, quote, vehicle to criticize real-world social ills, while also indulging our post-apocalyptic fantasies, end quote. Since its release, film historians have interpreted Night of the Living Dead as a subversive film that critiques 1960s American society, international Cold War politics, and domestic racism. Elliot Stein of The Village Voice saw the film as an ardent critique of American involvement in the Vietnam War, arguing that, quote, it was not set in Transylvania, but Pennsylvania. This was middle America at war and the zombie carnage seemed a grotesque echo of the conflict then raging in Vietnam. While Romero, end quote, while Romero denied he considered race when casting Dwayne Jones as the protagonist, reviewer Mark Deming notes that, quote, the grim fate of, du- of Dwayne Jones, the sole heroic figure and only African-American, had added resonance with the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X fresh in the minds of most Americans, end quote. The 1970s signaled a new age for horror films with the transition from classic to modern horror. The horror genre became increasingly aggressive and ruthless in tone, while also incorporating artistic qualities and societal themes. Film historian Peter Hutchings regards this as the era where horror films, quote, grew up. The critical and popular success of Rosemary's Baby led to the release of more films with occult themes in the 1970s, such as The Exorcist and The Omen both of which depict children becoming possessed by demonic influences and the struggles of their parents to save them. Some scholars read the religious anxieties and parental panic in these three films as a general ambivalence towards the youth countercultural movements of the 1960s. The works of horror author Stephen King began to be translated for the screen. First, there was Brian De Palma's 1976 adaptation of Carrie, King's first published novel about a timid teenager who possesses telekinetic powers, but who is constantly bullied by her peers and mother. Next, Stanley Kubrick directed a 1980 adaptation of King's third book, The Shining, which follows an aspiring writer and recovering alcoholic who accepts a position as the off-season caretaker of the isolated historic Overlook Hotel. The two films share themes of telepathy, insanity, and, once again, sinister children. Since then, dozens of King's novels have been adapted for the screen, including Salem's Lot, Christine, Children of the Corn, Pet Cemetery, Misery, and It. A cycle of slasher films began in the 1970s and continued through the 1980s with the creation of Halloween by John Carpenter. The film is about a serial killer named Michael Myers, who is committed to a sanitarium for murdering his teenage sister on Halloween night. Fifteen years later, he escapes and returns to his hometown, where he stalks a female babysitter and her friends. Here is a clip from the film. Bye. 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 
In Halloween, Carpenter shot many scenes from the perspective of the killer in order to build tension, an element which was adopted by subsequent slasher films. Media researcher J.P. Tollett notice, uh, notes that the film's primary concern is, quote, the way in which we see ourselves and, and others and the consequences that often attend our usual manner of perception. Toller further notes that, quote, as a result of this shift in perspective from a disembodied narrative camera to an actual character's eye, we are forced into a deeper sense of participation in the ensuing action, end quote. Other notable slasher franchises from this era include The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Friday the 13th, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and Hellraiser. These films all contain similar tropes, such as the hidden dangers of suburbia, absentee parents, a group of teenagers being stalked, a male killer with a signature weapon, mask, and theme song, and a final girl, usually depicted as shy and virginal, who must defeat the killer usually with his own weapon. As you might have guessed, the slasher subgenre has received considerable attention from feminist film scholars. Many critics and scholars claim that the horror genre hit a slump during the 1990s. The slasher franchises of the 80s had become dull, repetitive, and silly, and audiences began ignoring them. Adolescent filmgoers of this era instead began turning to special effects driven sci fi, superhero, and disaster films. To reconnect with its audience, horror became more self mocking and satirical, especially in the latter half of the decade. Peter Jackson's Dead Alive took the splatter film to ridiculous excesses for comic effect. Keenan Wayne produced Scary Movie, which was composed of comedy skits poking fun at various horror cliches. Wes Craven's Scream series featured teenagers who were fully aware of and often made reference to the history of horror movies and mixed ironic humor with the scares. Films such as Candyman, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and Urban Legend reflected upon the relationship between fictional horror and real world horror, and the dormant slasher subgenre was reignited for the MTV audience. One of the most significant serious horror films of the 1990s was Jonathan Demme's psychological thriller, The Silence of the Lambs. The film follows Clarice Starling, a young FBI trainee, as she seeks the, the advice of the imprisoned Dr. Hannibal Lecter, a brilliant psychiatrist and cannibalistic serial killer, in order to apprehend another serial killer, known only as Buffalo Bill. Here is a clip from the film. The Silence of the Lambs was critically acclaimed upon its release, with much of the praise reserved for the performances of Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins.
It was the first and still only horror film to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. Critic Aaron Mallon praised the film's use of close-ups, writing that, quote, it made the suspense personal and therefore way more frightening, end quote. Matthew, Lo- Matthew Lucas called the film, quote, somehow prescient, timeless, a dark portrait of humanity's very worst coupled with the hopeful idea of what it could be, end quote. The Silence of the Lambs helped usher in a wave, of, a wave of serial killer films, including Seven, The Bone Collector, The Talented Mr. Ripley, and American Psycho. Another successful horror film of the 1990s was the Japanese supernatural thriller, Ring. It follows a reporter who is investigating the mystery behind a cursed videotape that kills viewers seven days after they watch it. Critics have interpreted the film as as expressing a collision between traditional Japanese folklore and modern society. Colette Bellman argues that the traditional Japanese figure is expressed via a videotape which, quote, embodies contemporary contemporary anxieties in that it is technology through which the repressed past reasserts itself. The success of Ring launched a renewal of horror filmmak- a renewal of horror filmmaking in Japan and other East Asian countries, resulting in films such as The Grudge, Pulse, One Missed Call, and A Tale of Two Sisters. It also helped attract the attention of Western audiences and filmmakers to Asian horror cinema, with all of these films receiving American remakes. Where Hollywood horror of the 80s and 90s was largely was, sorry, had largely relied on on-screen violence, shock tactics, and gore, Ring helped to revitalize the genre by taking a more restrained approach to horror, leaving much of the terror to the audience's imagination. 1999 marked the release of The Blair Witch Project and the creation of a new subgenre of horror known as found footage. The film tells the story of three student filmmakers who hike into the Black Hills near Burkittsville, Maryland in 1994 to record a documentary about a local legend known as the Blair Witch. The three disappeared, but their recording equipment and footage is discovered a year later. The purportedly recovered footage is the film that the viewer sees. The Blair Witch Project is credited with with popularizing the found footage technique, which was later used in similarly successful horror films such as Paranormal Activity and Cloverfield. It is also thought to be the first major film marketed primarily via the internet. The film's official website featured faux police reports as well as newsreel-style interviews. These artifacts augmented the film's found footage premise to spark debates across the internet over whether the film was a real-life documentary or a work of fiction. A sleeper hit, The Blair Witch Project grossed nearly $250 million worldwide on a modest budget of $60,000, making it one of the most successful independent films and horror films of all time. Todd McCarthy of Variety called the film, quote, an intensely imaginative piece of conceptual filmmaking that also delivers the goods as a dread-drenched horror movie. The Blair Witch Project puts a clever modern twist on the universal fear of the dark and things that go bump in the night, end quote. In the 2000s, Horror films became even more extreme in their depictions of violence, with the Saw series, the Hostel series, the Wolf Creek series, and the films of Rob Zombie emphasizing sadism and bodily mutilation. Critics and detractors of this cycle of films referred to them as torture porn. However, Stephen King defended the Hostel series, stating, quote, Sure, it makes you uncomfortable, but good art should make you uncomfortable. End quote. Some film theorists have interpreted the subgenre as a reaction to the harsh political climate of post 9-11 America, and in particular, the Bush administration's use of torture against imprisoned terrorist suspects. For example, Aaron Michael Kerner argues that Saw and Hostel indulge a morbid fascination that the American public harbored regarding the violence which they knew was being conducted on their behalf. These films confront Western audiences with the moral responsibility for bloodshed which they share with their governments. In the 2010s, the horror genre became prominent on television, 
with series such as The Walking Dead, American Horror Story, True Blood, Dexter, Supernatural, and Stranger Things being broadcast to high ratings. Popular horror films were also adapted for television during this decade, with The Silence of the Lambs spawning Hannibal, Psycho spawning Bates Motel, and Evil Dead spawning Ash vs. the Evil Dead. While the 2000s and 20s... Sorry. While the 2000s and early 2010s were swamped with remakes, the latter half of the 2010s represents something of a revival for horror cinema across the globe. The past five years has seen a boom of original and critically acclaimed horror films. These include psychological horror films such as It Follows, The Babadook, Hereditary, and Mother. Historical horror films such as The Witch and Bone Tomahawk. Science fiction horror films such as A Quiet Place, Annihilation, Mandy and Bird Box and foreign language horror films such as A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, Train to Busan, Raw, Goodnight Mummy and Veronica. However, the most famous entry in this new wave of horror is Jordan Peele's racial satire Get Out. Get Out follows a young African-American man who uncovers a disturbing secret when he travels to upstate New York to meet the wealthy family of his Caucasian girlfriend. Here is a clip from the film. Hey, hang on. Chris, Chris, I want to introduce you uh, to some friends. This is uh, David and Marsha Wincott, Ronald and Celia Jeffries, Hiroki Tanaka, and Jessica and Friedrich Wolf. Do you find that being African American is more advantage or disadvantage in the modern world? It's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, man. Hey! Yo, man. They were asking me about the African American experience. Maybe you could take this one. Oh. Oh, well, I find that the African American experience for me has been, for the most part, very good. Although, I find it difficult to go into detail as I haven't had much desire to leave the house in a while. <laughs> <laughs> We've become such homebodies. Yes, yes, yes. So even when you go into the city, I've just had no interest. The chores have become my sanctuary. <laughs> Peel has stated that Get Out is a movie about racism, from the subtle racism that many African Americans have to endure 
on a day-to-day -day basis to the broader legacy of slavery in American society. He, has, he was inspired by earlier horror films such as Rosemary's Baby and The Stepford Wives, which he claims were able to address fears surrounding women's liberation in a way that was engaging and fun rather than preachy. The critical consensus on Rotten Tomatoes calls Get Out a, quote, funny, scary, and thought-provoking movie, which seamlessly weaves its trenchant social critiques into a brilliantly effective and entertaining horror comedy thrill ride, end quote. Peel has stated that his decision to combine horror and comedy was based on the importance of pacing in the two genres, and the fact that so much of the success of horror and comedy depends upon suspense and reveals. That concludes this brief history of horror movies. As we have seen, horror has proven a vital component in the development of cinema, from the silent era all the way up to the present day. Horror movies push the boundaries of genre, gender, class, nationality, and good taste, and can be understood through a variety of psychological and sociological lenses. They absorb and reflect universal human fears as well as the particular fears of a time and place. To quote Stephen King, horror serves as a barometer for those things that trouble the night thoughts of a whole society. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for listening and happy Halloween.